Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Be Is For Build. Behind me is my 44 foot long, 30 year old Italian yacht. And in the last episode, we uh, we hurt we hurt one of the engines that's in it. So in today's episode, we're gonna jump in there, we're gonna start looking at the engine, start doing a little bit of diagnostics, and, and we're gonna also look at what it would take to do an engine swap. And we're gonna talk about the different types of engine swaps that we could do on this boat, and the pros and cons of each of the different swap options that we have. And then I'm gonna ask you guys for your feedback. Have you guys let me know what you think and what you guys would like to see go into this boat so we can get it back on the water. Stay tuned. Before we get down to it today, I want to take a second out to thank our sponsor. Today's episode is sponsored by Simply Safe. Simply Safe is incredibly effective, reliable home security that'll make sure your home is safe. You just order it online or on the phone and it's delivered right to your house. You set it up yourself in under an hour. You just stick the sensors right where you need them and from there your home is professionally monitored 24 seven. And if anything happens, they'll make sure the police are called. They've got sensors to cover every window, room and door. Plus a lot of great extras like water sensors, temperature sensors and HD cameras. It's all really easy to use and you get around the clock protection for just 50 cents a day with no contracts. I don't know if you guys remember, but a couple years back I actually had an incident with some of my vehicles where they all ended up not having wheels. And after that I got really interested in home security and protection. And luckily we started working with Simply Safe right after that and I got their system installed in my house and I have one here installed in the shop as well. And it gives me a really nice sense of peace of mind and certainty that my house is all buttoned up when I want it to be. Here in the shop, I'll show you some of the stuff that we have. So we have our HD camera here that monitors the inside of the shop. Also outside, we have a couple that monitor the outside of the shop. And here we have the base station. And when the alarm is active, it actually glows blue like this. And I really like that because at night after I activate my alarm and I'm heading off to bed, I can glance over and I know it's on. And it gives me a little bit of peace of mind. And this is an example of one of our door sensors and it makes a little chime sound when the door opens, which I really like as well. And then we got our keypad here and we can do things like activate it, say, wow, oh, we're home. And there we go. This guy's my favorite. It's obviously a keypad, but it controls the deadbolt. And so at the end of the day, I just hit lock and it locks the door. And then, uh, you know, we have employees here and we have people that are coming in and out of the shop. So anybody that I give the code to, I can just give them the code. They can press the button and then they can get into the shop if I want them to. Or I can use the Simply Save app and I can unlock the door through my app, which is super handy. So guys, if you are interested in adding a little bit more safety and security to your home or shop or office space or anything like that, I, I urge you, check out Simply Safe. Go to simplysafe.com slash B is for build or click the link in the description. It's an amazing product. I've used it for over two years now and I'm super, super happy with it. And it's just been a great addition to my life. All right, let's get down to work. Here she be. We got her up and dry docked. So Oscar for scale. It's very, very high up in the air. Getting an engine out of here is going to be quite a challenge. I'm hoping they have something here at the yard that we can do. So we're in a DIY yard and this is one of the only yards in Oregon where we're actually allowed to work on our boat ourselves. So we can do all sorts of improvements while the boat is out of the water. So rest assured by the time this boat leaves, it'll be the best version of this boat that we could possibly make it. It'll be better than the day that we bought it and it will be ready to rip and continue its life on the water. All of the upgrades that we've ever wanted to do to this boat, but we always had the excuse, well, it's got to be out of the water. Now it's finally out of the water. So we can do all of those upgrades as well as do all of the maintenance that needs to be done on boats every couple of years to keep them in tip top shape. One second, Oscar wants help moving a table. We got to lift all the furniture out of there and down. It's not going to be easy. Got enough of the furniture off of here to uh, start pulling some of the oil out. So if you guys remember, we had an oil leak in the starboard engine, dropped a bunch of oil into there. So we're working on vacuuming it up, putting it into buckets, and then way we can take it home and recycle it. We have to be very careful here not to you know, have any contamination leave the boat. We filled up all our buckets. <laughs> so <laughs> we're done draining the boat for now. We gotta get this home and get it all recycled. You can see right down there, that's our propeller shaft and it goes out and into the water. And there's an old school uh, shaft seal down there that needed to be replaced last year. We kind of let it go for a little bit. So it drips a little bit of extra water and then we had one more weird uh, leak in the engine coolant uh, system. So kind of, kind of added a lot of water into the bottom of this guy. And uh, we're gonna replace that shaft seal with a new upgraded one that's dripless so we won't have to service it as much, which will be pretty cool. So the next thing we're gonna do is actually Actually tap into our uh, damaged engine when we turned it off there was a massive backfire that doesn't make much sense to Oscar and myself because it built a ton of pressure 
inside the valve cover, which isn't really what a backfire would do. So it's very uh, mysterious to us, but also diesels are mysterious to us as well. So we want to jump into that and we're actually going to pull the valve covers off and take a look at, see if we can find any easy damage that may be the cause of why that engine sounds bad. So let's start with these engines that are in here. It's very, very hard for me to explain the perspective of how large these engines are compared to a normal engine. Like there's a Kyle and there's an engine and that's only half of it. I would say if we had to guess, like fr from the turbo to the front of the engine is about seven feet and it's about five feet wide. Each one of these engines weighs 2,800 pounds, which is basically what a small vehicle weighs. And they make 425 horsepower. They even advertise it on the side. At first glance, I thought, wow, what an inefficient engine. That's ridiculous. We could buy an LS and just throw it in there and it makes 300 horsepower before any modifications at all and it only weighs 900 pounds. My mind immediately went to gasoline engines and how much horsepower you can get per pound of engine weight. But I've done a lot of learning about diesel engines a little bit of learning about diesel engines. And there's a reason for all of this weight and size. They're so, so massive for two reasons. One of them is because they are made to be able to run basically forever at their peak power limit. So with a car engine, for instance, you wouldn't wanna say 6,000 RPM is where you're hitting peak power. You wouldn't dream of putting your car there and just leaving it for four hours at a time. That's what these engines are actually designed to be able to do. Now, obviously in the case of that one, it couldn't, but that's not to say that it wasn't designed to be able to do. So that's what makes these engines a little bit more unique from what we're used to dealing with in the automotive world. The other reason they're so big is it makes it easier to build tons of low end torque. They can produce a ton of torque at a very low end. Now it's, this engine is exactly, the exact model is a VT903M. So it's a marine application of the VT Cummins 903 and they're Cummins brand diesels. And the T is for turbocharged and, and they're only, they're 30 years old, which kind of seems like a lot, but it's actually not really that old in the whole diesel world. It's not super easy to find part, source parts for these, but at the same time, it's not impossible. And I haven't been able to find actual torque specs for how much torque this engine produces, but I can tell you from looking at the history of Cummins engines, they haven't produced a 400 horsepower engine that doesn't produce 1,000 foot-pounds of torque. So the odds are it produces at a minimum 1,000 foot-pounds of torque. So that's a whole lot of torque, and that is also a reason that the engine is so big. Now, what does torque mean for a marine application? Well, based on your propeller, each propeller is designed to try and push the boat a certain amount of distance forward in the water per rotation. Until your boat gets up to that speed, it uses an immense amount of torque to push that water to keep pushing the boat through the water. And even at high speeds, at max speeds, it utilizes a ton of torque. The max speed on this boat as designed is 40 miles an hour. Our cruising speed, the last time we used it, we were going at a maximum of 23 miles an hour. Honestly, it would probably be pretty scary going 40 miles an hour on this boat, but it's something that we would like to do. And I guess where it gets really complicated is at a cruising speed of 40 miles an hour, we can't tell you how much this uh, boat wants to have torque wise or horsepower wise, because we don't know if the designers of this boat essentially overpowered this boat. This is an Italian designed boat. And guess what they were doing in the 90s with every Italian designed car? Small fiberglass car, lightweight, giant engine. Ferrari, Lamborghini, they made their name off of doing that. It's very, very possible that when Riva was designing this boat, they said, let's go get two of the biggest, most powerful diesel engines on the market right now and put them in this boat. It's very possible. So the only thing that that would mean if they did do that is that the engines would be utilizing less torque at the high speeds. But for now, we're gonna go off of this chart that I'm gonna show you on the screen right now. And what this chart is, is a brand new 400 horsepower Cummins engine. So it's the new modern model of this engine and it's power and torque specs per RPM, how much power, horsepower and torque it, it generates per RPM. And also the propeller completely spec'd out for this engine. It'll tell you what the propeller demand is. So for instance, you can see at its complete top end, it maxes out at its peak horsepower range of 420 horsepower, and it utilizes the propeller demand is 734 foot pounds of torque. That's what it wants. It's probably the exact same for these engines, but instead of peaking at 3,300 RPM, I believe they peak at 4,000. So a little bit different rev range, not too much. Looks like Oscar's got all of the bolts out of the valve cover. Let's jump down here and look at it a little closer. 
So this is the valve cover that built up a ton of pressure. If you guys remember, we blew the rubber gasketing out of here and Oscar saying it shot the oil cap off so hard that whatever it hit the fiberglass before it like dented it and bent the thing in and he had to bend it back just so we could fit it back on the engine. So we're wondering if, you know, there might be some damage that we can catch under here. And if it's accessible from here and something we could fix from here, man, would we be lucky? So we're going to try and crack this thing off now. It probably hasn't been off in 30 years give or take, so this will be interesting. And it probably weighs a whole lot. It's moving. It's moving over there. We're just like kind of moving the gasket around. There we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How heavy is it? It's not heavy. Oh, really? Yeah, this is pretty light. So there's water in here, that's what's yeah. creating this. Yeah, condensation is what mixed with oil. None of the other. Oh, we got something broken. If it's not broken, it's not happy. Well, no, it's it's fine. You think? Yeah. None of the other ones are loose like that. After immense deliberation, we have found out that's probably not out of spec. It just is a little bit loose because of the compression cycle. What we did see though, is we see a lot of water in here. And uh, what we're thinking is that it's a possibility that we blew the head gasket. Um, and then that's allowing the um, coolant to access the valve cover area or possibly there's coolant in our oil and then that's just coming up to the top of the engine because it's at the top condensation there's definitely water in here so this engine definitely needs to be rebuilt we just pulled our dipstick and it's 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 milkshake so we got oil entering in our water system wait <laughs> I know. <laughs> we have water getting into the oil system somehow. It probably churned it up into milkshake this last time that we ran it as we got it over here. A head gasket probably wouldn't make that sound, so it's going to be a head gasket and. So this engine is coming out and it's going to be rebuilt because uh, whether or not we want to put it back in or if we just want to sell it, it's going to get a lot more money if it's rebuilt. So it's worth it for me to pay a shop to rebuild it. I've been talking to a guy and I guess there's a shop 10 miles away from here that does this type of stuff and they could rebuild our engine. So I'm excited to go meet with them and see what the process would be to do that and how much time it would take to get that done. And I guess as far as our outlining of these diesel engines and these as an option, the last thing that I would want to stress about this is these engines are made to run flat out. So if we wanted to go 40 miles an hour and put these things at 4,000 RPM. These are designed and totally made to just go flat out and we could hold it there for hours with no expectation of these engines being harmed at all. And that's a very unique thing about um, these diesel and these marine applications. So now that we've gone over what we have, let's talk about other options. Let's stick with the diesels for now. So to go a Volvo diesel, they have the Penta D6 440, which would be a pretty much exact replacement for this. It's an inline six, it's a much smaller liter, but it's newer technology and stuff like that. It's gonna get better fuel economy. They run new about $70,000 a piece. So $140,000 for the two of them. Used, they're about $50,000 a piece. So 100K for two of them. Basically puts it out of my price range. Cummins makes some new ones too that they got out on the market and they're gonna be significantly cheaper. They're gonna be about $70,000 for two of them used. Let's say that's pretty solid price range for a, the, the thing that I showed you that torque chart on, those ones used about 75, 70 to $80,000 for two of them used. So feel free to comment what you guys think, but the way I've been looking at it is if we're gonna stay diesel, then we it's probably the most cost effective and best way to just fix these engines that are in here. They have relatively low miles. We just opened that valve cover and you can see that they don't have a lot of wear on them. So that does seem like if we want to stay diesel, we should probably just save ourselves, you know, lots and lots of money and have these diesels repaired. So let's talk about gas engines, gasoline. Back in the day, way back in the day, I want to say, I'm going to guess 1950 or 1960. I'll try and put the correct score on the screen. GM came out with some gasoline engines that can power boats my size. They're called 454s. It's a GM big block engine with some slight modifications, nothing too major. Mostly, I believe it was valve springs and they produce them to be used in marine applications. My boat is on the large side of what you'd want to power with twin 454s, but it's possible. My friend Chris Fix, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with him, his dad actually has a boat that is almost the same weight as this boat and relatively close to the same size, and it is powered by 454s. Gasoline costs a lot more than marine diesel. 
something to keep in mind when we're talking about the swap. Diesel is about two bucks and 50 cents a gallon, where gas is in the three dollar and something range. Gas engines are also a lot less efficient. At 18 knots cruising speed, a boat my size with the twin 454s is gonna go through about 25 gallons an hour. At actual flooring it, we're gonna go through 50 gallons an hour. So 150 bucks an hour going 40 miles an hour. Based on our diesel chart, if we stick with diesel, we're gonna get around at 40 miles an hour, just full tilt. We're gonna go through around 35 to 40 gallons an hour and diesel is a lot cheaper again. So gas engines for this boat are definitely doable, but we wouldn't actually just use these old 454s. That's old technology and we are partnered with Texas Speed. So imagine if we had Texas Speed spec us out a couple badass gas engines. High torque, high low end torque, middle of the range horsepower engines that we are designing to be basically bulletproof. Imagine an engine that could handle 1,000, maybe 1,200 horsepower if you boosted it, but we could run it naturally aspirated and get 600 horsepower, 500 foot-pounds of torque out of each engine. We change up our propeller a little bit so it has less required torque for each rev range and we just rev a little bit higher to get to our highest top speed. And then the really cool thing that we would get to do is run EFI, standalone electronic fuel injection and we would have a tunable ECU for each motor and imagine me up there with a laptop just throwing a little USB plug in there and making sure everything is totally fine. If we use like Holly, we could have a Holly standalone ECU with our Holly screens up there that would tell us every single metric on the engine, every single thing that we would wanna know about the engine and how it's performing. That'd be really nice to have all of that information. We could also build in some fail safes so this would never happen again. Like if we lose oil pressure for over a second, shut down the engine. If the temperatures get too hot, shut down the engine. So you could do a little bit of more mindless cruising around and not having to check your gauges and whatnot all the time. But to be honest, when you're driving a boat, there's not much else to do anyways. So it's not the hardest job in the world. Jumped you guys down into the engine bay. We actually closed the main hatches, but I wanna show you something. So the question would be, how would we do that? We'd take this massive 300 gallon diesel tank that's way back there at the end of the, the end of this engine compartment. We drain the diesel out of that, we'd put gas in there. And then we got our transmission right here for these Cummins. And what we would have to do is take the Cummins out, probably take the transmission with them and then bring the transmission back and adapt the LS to made up of that transmission. Or we could find out if there are some LS transmissions on the market and just use those LS transmissions that go to the, that shaft right there. That's our prop shaft and that gets it going down. But the cool thing about this transmission that I know it does is that takes a normal rotation engine. Both of these engines have normal rotation um, and then it reverses it to have a reverse rotation on the prop. So this prop's gonna spin normal rotation like this. And this one actually spins the other way, um, the prop shafts, because you have to have like a counter spinning motion so you don't torque steer your boat. I did a pretty bad job of explaining that, but basically boats need one prop that goes this way and one that goes this way, and then they develop the prop so when they each spin their respective ways, whatever it is, that the boat still goes forward and it's not one going forward and one going in reverse. And they do that so you don't. I guess this is probably the point too where I should remind you guys that here at B is for Build, we jump into projects head first and we have a lot of fun with them thinking what's the worst that's gonna happen. We try and have a point to safety and being really safe. But other than that, we wing it and we don't know what we're doing 100% of the time. So don't take anything that I'm saying as gospel. I have a background in software engineering. Oscar has a background in professional welding and Kyle has a background in the Marines. So we're really showing you guys the learning process that we go through when we build things. And we're not saying that we do everything right. And we're not saying that we always make the right decisions. We just try and be safe and have fun. So when it comes to gas powered engines, if we go that route, we are going to Texas Speed. They could have some engines built pretty quickly, quick turnaround. Retail price on those engines is 30 grand. So it's not as heavy hitting on the wallet as some of the other options. So last but not least, let's talk about what was my favorite option and what I was certainly 100% sure I was going to do to this boat, which is electric swap it. We we're gonna use Tesla parts to have a Tesla powered yacht. How cool would that be? Absolutely silent running through the water, battery powered, plug it in at night, recharge it, come back out the next day, get on the river. The day after we blew this motor, I went home and I called the guys over at Stealth EV. They are like the end all be all on building awesome electric powered stuff. They've given me a ton of advice about electric stuff thus far because someday we wanna partner with them and build an electric car. The time just hasn't came right. So I thought, electric boat, let's do this. By the way, I'll put a link in the description to their website. Definitely go check it out if you're interested in any EV stuff. 
And if you want to hear stuff go bang with internal combustion, go to Texas Speed. I'll put a link in the description for them too. Oscar, I will remember to put those links. <laughs> so I call the owner over at Stealth EV and we start talking about it. And uh, so let's, let's just paint a picture. We need an engine with torque and we need an engine with horsepower. The insanity mode drive units from a Tesla, two rear drive units we could easily fit in this boat with two battery packs from a P85D. That's an 85 kilowatt hour full pack from a car. So let's do two packs, obviously one from each car and two engines, one from each car. Yeah, that should do it. So that'll give us uh, 700 horsepower per engine, 500 foot pounds of torque per engine. Motor, electric motor, is it an engine? Electric engine, electric motor. So I thought the numbers, you know, they work out pretty good. Maybe we wouldn't be able to do the top speed of 40 miles an hour anymore, but what do I care, right? Most of the time we go about 10 miles an hour around the river. And then if we want to cruise from direction to direction, we'd like to go 20 miles an hour. Not too much. So then Matt over at Stealth EV broke down the news for me or broke down the math and I backed it up. I hit my, my buddy Jason Fenske over at Engineering Explained actually on the way over here and I said, um, how, can I, how can I correlate you know, EV power, electric power with a Tesla motor and stuff like that to gasoline? And he's like, I, ha I actually have the, the numbers. So let me tell you. One gallon of gasoline essentially equals 337 kilowatt hours. The battery packs, remember, are 85 kilowatt hours a piece. So we have 170 kilowatt hours of juice on the boat if we use two battery packs. So I just told you earlier, going full tilt, we're gonna go through 50 gallons an hour. If you do the math, we would run through two full Tesla battery packs in six minutes, taking this boat 40 miles an hour. Doesn't get much better if we slow down to 20 miles an hour, we might get 30 minutes. That's about it. 20 miles an hour, we only get 30 minutes of range. And then you have to plug in and you have to charge for at least 10 hours. Most likely though, because we're splitting it across two battery packs and there's only a certain amount of amperage from a plug coming out of the marina, it might be like a 24 hour charge to recharge your batteries. If you wanted to go slowly, seven miles an hour, 10 miles an hour, the game does really, really change. Without the boat being up on plane, it takes a lot less energy to just propel the boat slowly through the water without creating a lot of wake. You can look at it like, as we create wake. When we were creating a huge wake going down this thing, we're moving so much energy across the river. All that energy comes from somewhere and it comes from the fuel that we're burning. If you're not creating that wake and you're just slowly jetting through the water, it's a lot, lot more efficient. You're getting to the point where some of these small sailboats only burn like half of a gallon per hour. So I have all the faith in the world that if we Tesla swap this thing and we move slowly and elegantly, silently, through the water with zero emissions, we could get some serious range. We could probably go 30 miles, 40 miles, maybe 50 or 60 miles in a day. It's just gonna be probably at about seven miles an hour. Silent, but slow and boring. Also would not be super hard to wire up an autopilot system so the boat would drive itself. Now we can do that with gas, with diesel, with electric. It's not the game plan right now because I'd rather just drive fast and actually steer it. But if I was going a boring speed of seven miles an hour down the river, I'd definitely hook up autopilot. But the unfortunate way that I look at that is basically if we did do that, first of all, it costs about 70 to $80,000 for the parts. Um, and then once we got that done, this boat would be kind of destined to stay at its spot on our river in the Willamette, going up and down the river very slowly and really not doing anything else, which is kind of our MO. It's kind of what we've been known to do, but I would love to be able to have the ability to go further and also, if we ever want to sell this boat one day, I don't know what the resale value on a boat that really can't go very far would be. Oscar also brought up a really great point when I was talking to him about the idea of going electric. He said, if you ran out of gas, someone can bring you gas or someone can bring you diesel. No one can bring you more electricity. So if you do accidentally ever run out, you are like 100% having to get towed. Now that I've basically done like a brain dump and just told you everything that I've been thinking over the last few days. Over the last few days, I, I started in electric world, cruised all the way through gas world, came back around to diesel world, and now I'm, I'm in my mind, I'm bouncing between gas and diesel. Um, but I just wanted to throw this out there and like have you guys give us feedback. Let us know in the comments. I will legitimately have someone read every single comment to tell us every single person's opinion. I think we're gonna tally them up um, into a couple categories and I'll let you know in the next episode. In the next episode, we're pulling the diesel engines out of this thing. We talked to the guy that runs the yard here. It's totally possible. We're gonna bring in some crazy ass machinery. You might actually have to take the top of the boat section off 
to be able to pull the <laughs> engines out. We don't know, but we're gonna really be diving into this thing. So those engines are going out and they're gonna get rebuilt and refreshed and, and put back to way, the way they were, no matter what, just in case if we're gonna sell them for the swap. But let me know what you guys think. Let me know what you guys would like to see. And once we get those babies out, we can see the damage and we'll make our decision and we'll keep it going. But we have a lot of other good work to do on the boat as well uh, for improvements to make sure that the next time it's in the water, it's in its best quality as possible. Thank you guys so much for watching. Let me know what you think. We'll see you guys on the next one. Peace. Come, come, come on.